But I want to read the introduction that I wrote in uh, the chapter, Divine Disappointment, All Forsook Me But the Lord. Now this is how divine disappointment is, divine, is uh, defined. A situation God allows for the purpose of getting our affections and focus off anyone or anything that has become preeminent above Christ in our lives. So here's the intro. Has someone you put on a pedestal whom you may have looked up to as a spiritual hero ever come crumbling down off that pedestal in your eyes? Has someone whom you considered to be a friend ever stabbed you in your back by a critical comment they made about you that eventually got back to you through the rumor mill? Have you ever trusted someone to do something and they failed to do it? Those questions are examples of the ways by which we experience the divine discipline of divine disappointment. Disappointment comes when your expectations have not been fulfilled. In most cases, disappointment is the result of someone else blowing it, but sometimes God allows you to be a disappointment to someone else. So here tonight, we want to examine both of those aspects of divine disappointment and we will see it illustrated in the last chapter, chapter 4 of uh, 2 Timothy. And Paul is writing here, and he says, he's writing to Timothy, who Timothy was not able to be with him, but he says, Do your diligence to come shortly unto me. Now he names names here. By the way, years ago, I... Uh, was pastoring a church, and I was going to be preaching on divine disappointment, I forget, or what, what something similar to it. And I announced on Sunday morning, I said, folks, tonight I'm going to name the person in our church who I have the most problems with. Well, I could tell folks, they didn't know what to think. And I think there may have been a few more people at church that night. But you know who I named as the person I have more problems with than anyone else? Bobby Mullins. <laughs> I told him, you know, dealing in my own life, that's, you know, that's what I have to deal with more than anything else. And so that helps me sometimes in dealing with other people. I'm not quite as harsh. But Paul says, Demas, he names names. Demas has forsaken me, who loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to thee for the ministry. Paul had, had a falling out with Mark at one time in his life, but now that's been resolved. Amen. Antichicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when you come, bring it with you and the books, especially the parchments. Now he names another name here. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware, because he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answered no man, at my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Really Demas and uh, Alexander the coppersmith are the ones who had really done the most harm with Paul. I don't know if Alexander the coppersmith was truly saved or not. They were men whom Paul had had a good relationship. But even some of the others he would like to have been with him weren't. There were some Paul had sent away, but he was at a point in his life. You ever had a pity party? You ever feel like uh, nobody loves you? When well, that's, of course, not the case. But you just have those times in your life. You're down. Paul may have felt, you know, there's nobody there. He's in prison. He feels neglected. He needed his coat because it's about to be winter if it wasn't already winter. And as for it, you know, physically, when you're down, 
you feel like the whole world is down. You wonder sometimes about your own friends. But he said here, all forsook me but the Lord. And that's what I've titled this chapter in the book and this message tonight. Anybody disappointed you in recent weeks? Well, first of all, we'll deal with the fact of people disappointing us. I uh, Now with Facebook, with instant media, within this past year, some people who have been even close to my own family at one time uh, have done things that have been disappointing to us, been disappointing to a lot of people. The one thing that I never want, I, you know, the golden rule says, likewise, whatsoever you would that others should do to you, do to them. I, I, I don't want to be vindictive about anybody. I don't want to go after anybody. And uh, I, I guess there was a time in my life, I think the older I get, I read through the Bible every year. Now I'm reading through the Bible about every seven or eight months and starting reading it again. I mean, I, I've just gotten a, uh, a renewal, intense renewal, reading the Bible even more so than years past. But there's one phrase that comes to my mind that John the Baptist said about Jesus that is how I feel now. He must increase, I must decrease. I look at sometimes, I want to say this, before you ever criticize somebody else, is there anything somebody could criticize you about? It is to the point today, I think Facebook can be a marvelous tool, can be used in a good way, but some of the meanest statements I see made about other people are on Facebook and some are by people who call themselves Christians. It, uh, you know, I've seen uh, coaches fall. We're seeing now with the movie stars, we're seeing now stuff that many of us men probably always knew uh, I would never mistreat a woman. I was taught not to do that, and Christian men don't, but other men can sense things about other men. You wonder sometimes what's going on with that guy. Now you actually find out he's been mistreating a lot of women, and that's wrong. The Bible says you ought to love your wife as Christ loved the church. He died for the church. That's how much you ought to love your wife. You ought to never physically abuse a woman. You know, it's worse enough when men get in fights with each other, but never use a woman in that manner. But we're talking about divine disappointment. People can really disappoint you. You find out things against some people, you think, well, I thought they were better than that. And then you find out that they weren't. At this point in Paul's life, he needed somebody who would be there just to be a friend. One of the stories uh, I read one time about Norman Vincent Peale. Uh, you know, up there in New York where he lived, I guess they may have had vehicles, but a lot of times they would ride cabs, they would go by the trains and all that ran in the area. And uh, Norman Vincent Peale, when his mother got on up in years, he had put her at a place out maybe on Long Island, something like that, but it was a good ways from downtown New York City. And uh, he got the word one day that, you know, his mother had died. And so he needed to make the long trek out there. And, of course, as he was writing about his mother, he shared some, he was close, shared some wonderful stories. But... He was on the, the train, and as he got there, another stop, uh, a well-known executive, very well-known man in the New York area got on at the same time, and he was exchanging some pleasantries with Norman Vincent Peale. Norman knew the man well, knew where he lived, and so as the train was moving on, uh, he asked Norman, well, why are you here today? He said, well, my mother died, just died, and so I'm on my way out to where she's at, and I'm going to try to make arrangements. And he said that from that point on, that neither one of them said much of anything. 
just a little conversation, and it came to the place where that well-known executive, Norman knew it, was supposed to get off to, to go to his home. He said he didn't get off. And when he kept going, Norman said, watch me. He said, I just want to ride with you, Norman. And so he went way out of his way, rode with Norman Vincent Peale till Norman went out where his mother was. And they didn't say much, but Norman Vincent Peale said that probably meant more to him than just about anything that ever happened in his life. That man was so busy. You knew he had all these things going on, but he took the time to be with Norman Vincent Peale at a very difficult time in his life. You know, I guess that's one of the greatest disappointments that any of us can have is that when we would want, we just need somebody to be with us, you don't have somebody with you. But see, this is one thing Paul was able to say, all forsook me, but the Lord. The Lord will never leave us or forsake us. He's always there with us. And I know sometimes, you you know, you wonder, but just... Sometimes just think about the Lord's presence with you. Talk to Him. Moses talked to God as a friend to a friend. And I, I believe in the respect to God as our Heavenly Father. But I know this, I talk to my own father sometimes as a friend to a friend. And it's the same way that you can talk to God. And He'll understand. But you know, there are times in life that uh, the Lord allows us to feel like all forsaken me but the Lord. There was a time, of course, uh, in all the great prophets where they all would have their times, Lord, why are you doing this? People want to kill me, <laughs> you know, Lord. But they would stay at it and God used them in a mighty way. You see, God will allow this to happen in our lives so that Christ may be preeminent in our lives. The one thing I know about Paul he always kept Christ preeminent in his life. There were th three times, I believe it was, that he prayed he had a thorn in his flesh and he prayed that God would remove it and God didn't do it. And he said "That's that the power of Christ may be manifested in me. People always wonder, well, what was his thorn in the flesh? I'll tell you what, he didn't tell us because God wanted us to know that whatever your thorn in the flesh may be, that God can take care of it. You may be in a situation right now. You may be watching this program. You're by yourself. God is there with you. Get, a, get the Bible. I've never picked up the Word of God and, and read it that the Bible does not just lift me up. One of the things that I would encourage you to do, read the book of Psalms. One thing you can do is read every fifth Psalm, whatever day of the month it is, like if it was the 6th of the month, then read the 36th Psalm, the 66th, the 96th, the 126th. It's amazing sometimes how all of those Psalms will tie in together. But that way you can get through the book of Psalms each month. And I one year, I didn't read through the entire Bible. That's what I usually do. But one year, I just read through the book of Psalms every month and the book of Proverbs. There are 30 Proverbs, uh, 30, 31 Proverbs, and you read one for each day of the month, and then read five Psalms a day. That was an interesting year. I, I tell you, folks, every time I read the Psalms, if I'm upset or down and I begin reading in the Psalms, it, it lifts, me, lifts me up. And so you, you feel forsaken by God right now getting, getting to the Bible and read it. That Christ may be preeminent in your life. But you know, sometimes in life... And boy, this is tough. God allows us to be a disappointment to someone else. I call that about come crashing down off that pedestal. I, I just see this all around sometimes that some people become so enamored with someone, particularly in, in spiritual places, they don't think that person can do any wrong. I know of a situation years ago where you know, there was a man who had said some things that would be considered, uh, you know, verbal discrimination of, of women, uh, wasn't the right thing to say, maybe sexual harassment. And I remember seeing a lady one day after I, and she got to talking about that, and she made this statement. 
he had the inability to say those things against those or say that about women. And I guess usually I don't try to speak up too much, but I said, well, I got to tell you something. I heard him say those things at times myself. And, you know, I caught him to task on it, and that's when, you know, he kind of told other people, and you get people then not liking you. I, folks, it's amazing what we might have within us that we can do. But uh, if we become a disappointment to someone, that's to keep us from becoming puffed up with pride. It also removes the pressure from that person you put on that pedestal who sometimes shouldn't be there that they can come crashing down off of it. And uh, Paul was disappointed. He became a disappointment to some people at some time. As a matter of fact, he talked about one time how Peter was a disappointment to Paul in a situation. I guess we can all disappoint one another at some times in our life. But I still want, like what Paul said. All forsook me, but the Lord. Three wonderful, victorious words. Three life-changing, situation-changing, situation-improving, doubt-erasing, uh, despair-removing words, but the Lord. The God who disciplines us, as I write in Divine Disciplines, is also the God who delivers us. And even if you're experiencing divine disappointment right now towards somebody else, or maybe you've done something to disappoint somebody else, just remember this, God will deliver you. So see, God allows divine disappointment that Christ may be preeminent in your life to keep you from being puffed up with pride, but that you may point others to Christ. If you've disappointed someone, apologize, ask their forgiveness and God's forgiveness. Admit, admit your need of help and then keep pointing people to Jesus. Divine disappointment is for the purpose of getting our affections and focus off anyone or anything that is preeminent above Christ in our life. It may drive us to our prayer closet and to our knees. I pray if you're watching this program tonight and you don't even know if you're really saved. The Bible says uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus you will be saved and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you're saved. Just say a simple prayer like this. Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to turn from my sins. I believe that Jesus died to save me from my sins. And I want to trust in him as my Lord and Savior. And I want to live for him from this point on in my life. And friends, that's what the Bible says a person must do to be saved. Only you know if you're saved. Nobody else can do it for you. But it's not a complicated process. And I pray that Maybe even this night you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you have, share it with somebody. Let somebody know, I've become a Christian. I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Commit to live for Him. It won't always go your way. But I tell you what, you'll have the Lord there. He won't forsake you. And you'll be able to say with me as I close this program out every week, thanks be to you, O oh God, who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 